I'd like to make two requests, please. One, that your questions be questions, not a uh, long story before the question. And that two, that your questions be not of a personal nature, that they be general questions. If you have something personal about yourself, take it up with the doctor personally. Um, so if you can respect those two rules, we'll get started. And please indicate which doctor your question is directed to or if it's just in general. Thank you. Okay, all right, this is a general question. Um, just about POTS medications. Um, so my doctor um, tried, started me on carbidopa, and I know it's also been popular a lot amongst un, some other doctors as well. So I just kind of wanted to know your general consensus about your thoughts on it, and um, I guess you know what you guys think about it as you know a, as a general medication for use in the in the future. Yeah, in POTS, right? Not Parkinson's. <laughs> There's actually a study that is done, I think, at Vanderbilt, I don't know if it's been published, looking at carbidopa in POTS. And the reason it was done was actually to test um, whether inhibiting renal dopamine would decrease peeing. Sorry, the amount voided. Um, you know. <laughs> so basically whether we can improve blood volume and then fix the heart rate and other issues. And, and obviously we're looking at catecholamines and stuff like that as well. Um, and I believe the short answer was it didn't work. Hi. Do we know how to judge when to stop with the amount of salt that we're adding to the diet? One teaspoon, teaspoon. I know we said two to four, but how do we judge? Do we go all the way to four? Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, and as yet unpublished data, um, I've found that about 90% of people with chronic orthostatic intolerance that are told to eat lots of salt and drink lots of water 90% of them are getting too much water and not enough salt. Um, I've seen two people in the last two years who managed to get too much salt. Um, too, much salt. too much salt meaning their serum osmolality got too high. The total concentration of our blood got too high. Uh, generally what happens is the total concentration of your blood gets diluted the more water you drink and only when it gets quite low does your salt craving kick in. Or at least that's what, that's what it looks like. Um, so if, you have a, if you're trying to decide do I need more salt or not, the odds are that you do. Um, and the simplest way for me to explain that is that your body has to keep this serum osmolality, the total concentration of everything in your blood, in a fairly narrow range uh, in order for other body processes to work normally. Every time you drink plain water, you're diluting out your blood. The only way to get your blood concentration back up is either to hold on to salt or pee out the water you just drank. So that's the explanation for why some people are dehydrated from drinking so much water. Uh, and that's why we encourage people to drink uh, electrolyte replacement fluids as opposed to plain water. Uh, I can't give numbers as to how many grams of sodium each person should consume per day because it varies from person to person. Uh, but in general, um, most people need more salt and less plain water. So, so I will quantify it. Um, so we, we tell people 10 to 12 grams, but the reality is it's all made up, and, and most of you won't be able to track that anyway. I certainly can't. If you're really concerned, you know, the issue isn't actually how much you think you're taking in. The, the issue is how much is actually getting in. And assuming that you eat roughly the same thing over the, over the last few days, like you haven't significantly altered your diet, so that excludes anything that you're doing right now right after traveling, but when you get home and give it a week, what you pee out is what you put in. You'll be in you should be in steady state if your diet is stable. So if you did a 24-hour urine and measured the sodium, that should give you an idea of what you've taken in. And uh, you know, in various high-salt studies, I mean, in the dietary salt study that we've been doing at Vanderbilt, our high-salt, we were targeting 300 milliequivalents per day, which is... I, I suspect very few of you are there. You know, the diet we had to do to get that is, is a very aggressive. I'd certainly want, you know, if we're pushing salt, for you to be above 200 millicoulons a day um, and on the higher side. So if, you, if you're concerned that you, maybe you're there already and you, what, should you really go further, we don't do it often because often, as Dr. Pazinski said, I think the best approach is just, you know, do it till it hurts. But, um, but you can actually assess that. And if you're curious, you can ask your doctor to 
measure the concentration of sodium in your urine. If your urine sodium is low, then you know your kidneys are trying to hold on to salt because you're not getting enough. Well, I, I, I agree with uh, Satish. Uh, after about three days uh, of a constant diet, no matter what, what goes in has come out. So you wouldn't measure the sodium concentration. You measure the 24-hour urinary sodium excretion. Normal uh, 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 sodium excretion is roughly 100, 125 milliequivalents of sodium per day. So the target would be 200 at least, and uh, 300 is kind of heroic. I don't know. Uh, that's not easy to do. Yeah. That's because I mumble. And anyway, no comments, just questions. <laughs> uh, what, I what, <laughs> what I was saying is uh, you come into balance uh, after about three days on a constant diet. It doesn't matter what your sodium intake is, it comes out. So you can monitor your sodium intake by monitoring your 24-hour urinary sodium excretion. Normal sodium excretion uh, in America, anyway, is roughly 100 to 125 milliequivalents per day. Uh, 200 would be kind of a reasonable target for a high salt diet, and 300 is heroic. To piggyback off that question, um, some electrolyte drinks and uh, thermotabs, for example, have potassium and other things. When you're getting that much sodium and targeting that sodium, is there a risk for overdoing it with the potassium and the other electrolytes? Everything is balance. So, I mean, you don't, you don't need thermotabs, right? There are other ways you can, there's the stuff you get at uh, Kroger, I don't know what the local store is, but the cheap grocery store brand, the sodium's as good as, you know, Himalayan sea salt. Um, Sorry, I apologize if the sponsor's here. Um, you know, or thermotabs. Right? If you need it in the form of tablets, you can actually get one gram sodium chloride tablets. It, personally, I think it's better if you can do it by diet to do it by diet than any tablet. But, but yes, I mean, thermotabs contain a bunch of stuff, right? And so if you're doing it just for the sodium, you're gonna, and you're taking lots of, lots of the thermotabs to get the sodium in, you're going to get lots of the other stuff. Now, are you going to get enough potassium to harm yourself? Unless you're really, really taking a ton, probably not. But is there a risk? There is. I, I have a question. My daughter's 24. Um, she has POTS, um, EDS, and MALS. Functionally disabled from these conditions for several years. Um, I'm trying to take my cues from her. Um, but I'm, my struggle is, um, how much do I push for some of these great ideas you guys all have? I'm hearing some great things the last couple days here. Um, she's exhausted. Um, she doesn't have the energy to, uh, to do some of the things that's being recommended here, um, as far as the exercising, um, to go to some of these appointments, to some of these physicians that are several hours away. We have great doctors, um, but she's exhausted and she doesn't have much hope. So um, I, I'm looking for some guidance um, as to, to how I can encourage her and be supportive, but also get her the best care and things that she needs. Since I have the microphone, I'll start with that. So. Uh uh, this is a, actually, you know, a very common thing that they come to us. Uh, Emma, you know, I'm in Houston, and we have patients coming from Oklahoma, from uh, Louisiana, uh, and unfortunately, there is what you see here is the experts, and uh, they are only located in certain cities, and as you know, um, traveling to these cities sometimes it can be troublesome if you are not near to you know, one of these cities that these experts are in, probably you need to travel a lot to, for this. The good news that uh, 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 physicians are more aware of this now compared to five years or 10 years ago. Definitely, they are more aware of that. And uh, the general advice is that we give for, um, you know, and, and I will say that, especially I'm a pediatric, uh, you know, cardiologist, so I treat mes mostly adolescent and young adults. And, uh, you know, most of them, when they will comply with the general advices about fluids, 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 uh, electrolytes, and, you know, get rid, power aid, uh, uh, sport drinks, avoid caffeine, doing the exercise, we call it anti-gravity exercises and maneuvers. And uh, it has, you know, it is very well elaborated in the uh, uh, website. I think this uh, this International they have a very good link for that. 
and they will look at that. So that part is very important. I say yesterday that it is about 50% of the improvement comes from the patient effort. And one of the patients, she told me, it's more than that. I found out that, you know, my effort helped more than medicine, more than 50%. It's, my effort helped me probably by 60 to 70% and the medicine just kicked in, you know, to help me with my blood pressure and my heart rate, which is really, you know, I think that's a great thing. So motivation is the key for this. Now, uh, this is a challenging condition, and I know that uh, people who has this, especially, you know, your daughter is 24, she will feel depressed that everybody is going to party and, you know, going for fun, and I can't go anywhere out of this chair or out of this bed, and I'm just disabled with that. So there is a very big component for psychological impact in this. And we can't ignore that, and we have to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, address that. Now, you have to remember, this psychological impact is secondary. It's not a primary disease of this youngster. So she is reacting to her condition rather than having a depression causing this. And, you know, uh, but uh, it's, it's stating that we found uh, we have a very good group in Houston, a young lady, uh, she decided in her own to start uh, a, a social uh, uh, link for all the patients who has dysautonomia. And she's getting a party twice a, a year for them where all these young people between 16 to 21, they will come together for, and, you know, having this. And they will chat about that. And it's helpful, I saw that, uh, it's helpful to talk about this disease with other people who has it. And uh, so what did you do for this? What, 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 how, how could you help yourself doing this? Who's, you know, what's, what's the medication that you have uh, more benefit from that? So getting the experience or, uh, you know, from the patient themselves, sometimes it can be helpful. So that's another motivation that probably you need to tell her about is getting into these websites and links that you can socially in, uh, interact with. And definitely I emphasize the point more than 50% of the improvement comes from the motivation of the patient of doing what we are saying to them to do, which is exercises, fluids, electrolytes, ca avoid caffeine, and healthy lifestyle. My only comment would be that uh, uh, pain and non-restorative sleep, pain and poor sleep, are the major drivers for fatigue in this population. So I would look at those two things and see if you can optimize her pain control and do anything to improve the quality of her sleep because, as you said, with no energy, she's, it's going to be hard for her to do a lot of the things she needs to do to get better. I was just going to say that you, the question you asked is one that probably most parents who came and spoke to me um, were asking as well. So um, I think it's, it, there's very much, I'm hearing from the parents that are here, that here are all these great ideas, but, but how do we get there? And um, I think it's useful to think about the fact that when you're working with adolescents and other young people, often they're flipping between being really scared four-year-olds, who you almost need to approach in that way, to recognize they're very fearful, to recognize you need to pick your battles, um, and to really sit alongside and recognize that a lot of what they're doing is, is motivated by, by fear you know, and exhaustion. But also at other times, they're kind of some of the most astute and sensitive and insightful people. Um, and that's when it's really worth listening to them and um, getting alongside. And when I say getting alongside, um, in terms of actually sitting along, sometimes adolescents speak to you much better when you're both engaged doing something else. That's often a good time you know, to bring these things up. But also to recognize that they are wise souls who really want to work collaboratively with you on this. And I think to manage that dialogue really well also means that you need to look after yourself and be in a really good space to be calm and, and have that discussion. And so in, to get professional support to manage that for both of you is really helpful because I think the other thing is that you know that um, your young people, they listen to you sometimes, but sometimes they listen to the same message from somebody else much better. Um, so it's worth thinking about that too. Uh, you know, in my experience, uh, what patients tell me is that they get exhausted to the point of exhaustion and to the point of despair and not wanting to look elsewhere because they have looked too much. 
Okay, now we live in an era which is great that we have all this information. You know, we go to the internet, it's easy to find things, but we're, for patients, we're even more confused at the end than at the beginning. And this is what I hear all day long. So I don't know why your daughter is exhausted. There might be several reasons, and some of them my colleagues talked about. But I think that one of the things, okay, is important, is to create a relationship with one physician, trust that physician, knowing that this physician knows about POTS and about the, all the details, and stop looking all the time for other opinions here and there, or even, I would say, stop really go and dig every single word, every single study that comes out on the internet. I think this may help a lot. And the personal relationship with the physician that you trust, believe me, is more important than any other, than any other information that you can get from, from the internet. Okay, so my question is a follow-up to the IV saline therapy panel yesterday. Um, several times it was discussed about um, blood volume and plasma volume, and so I'm wondering, is it important for POTS patients to have that tested, and if so, how is that done? So the, the, so the reality is that uh, the treatments for the low volume are, are limited, right? So I think regardless of what you have in terms of form, you're probably, you've probably received, and, and I think most people here would agree with the salt and water part of the advice. Um, so if your blood volume's low, the challenge is that, you know, so what are you going to do to fix it? Um, one option is Florinef, which is something that can be tried empirically. Um, it sounds like Dr. Abdullah will, and Dr. Grubb use DDAVP a little more aggressively if, if that's low. Then there aren't, I mean, and then obviously there's the exercise option, but there aren't a lot of other sort of specific levers you can push in that regard. So I think it's, it can be a useful piece of information to have to understand the mechanisms. And, and if, if there's a reason why you wouldn't want to be on Florinef, and, and certainly it has their side effects issues and cost issues in some cases where the price of tolerability is higher, should we really push, then I think the information may be useful. But I don't think it's an absolute need. Um, because I think you, you could just empirically follow that approach and try it. If you tolerate the floor and you do well, then that's more important than what the number shows. The how you get it, um, blood volume tests for the most part are nuclear medicine tests. Um, you can track plasma volume in that way or you can track red cell volume. They're both different techniques from nuclear medicine labs in your hospital. Um, some use, we use the technique by Daxor Corporation at Vanderbilt. There are a bunch of centers with that. Um, that's a plasma volume technique, but, but different hospitals may use different techniques. I just want to say something, uh, just, I don't know, maybe this was mentioned already, but I'm big on basics, and uh, I find many patients just simply haven't had salt pushed enough. I mean, they get the concept, but it's very important to have lots of salt, and because the gut doesn't always work that well, Sometimes you don't really get what you think you're getting. So you may be taking four grams twice a day, but you're only getting one gram twice a day. So I use the very simple 24 hours urine sodium to make sure that you're getting more, and you know, at least 170 milliequivalents, sometimes 200, 210 milliequivalents of salt. Sorry? Really? Okay, so you just talked about it, and I'm repeating everything that was just said. <laughs> it's good advice. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, all of you, because um, personally I have learned a lot in these two days, like last year. Uh, but I have always a feeling, and even more this time than last year, uh, a certain feeling of confusion as a caregiver, because my daughter was diagnosed five years ago as POTS, and it was the visible part of the iceberg. And then it uh, came out that she had EDS, hypermobility, and then she had mast cells activation disorders, and then she had carry one malformation. And in these two days, we have seen a lot of overlapping of these different disease, quote unquote. So, and also in terms of treatment, sometimes it's 
counterproductive. If you do too much exercise or if you practice like we have started the Levine protocol, uh, it was not good for my daughter because she had EDS and it was very bad for her. So we had to change the kind of exercise, for example, etc., etc. Et so my question is, as a caregiver, I am not a specialist, I am not a doctor, but I had to be uh, self-educate and to learn a lot about this and to do the role that I don't want to do of coordinator. Uh, because when you want to see a doctor, even if you love him and, he, and you think he's a great specialist and you trust him, he doesn't know uh, if he's a cardiologist. Not always he knows about mast cells, not always he knows about EDS, and not always he, he knows about carry one, etc. Or GI. I forgot the GI dimension, which is huge. <laughs> So, you know, as a caregiver, you said, oh my God, what should I do? Should I emphasize on the EDS part? Because when you see the presentation of Dr. Tinkle, you said, oh my God, my daughter, it's exactly all this. So should I go to see the specialist of EDS and then work for there, from there, and then develop around? Or should I emphasize to the neurologist instead and start from the neurologist and, and start from there? So as a caregiver, I am very confused about that. How do you put it together on a more comprehensive umbrella? Uh, I had example with the GI issues my, my daughter had. And at the end, it, you don't know from which side to, to, to really focus the battle, because it's a battle. So my question to all of you is, what would be the best strategy for this kind of population of POTS or dysautonomia, which is much more, as Dr. Chelimsky said, that only POTS. It's, it's a kind of visible part of the iceberg, but behind that, we don't know. So thank you very much. Well, <laughs> I think I already gave you part of my answer before um, in a one-to-one, but um, it really depends, unfortunately, of where you are and who are the players in the medical field in, in your area that you have available. Because if you ask a neurologist, a lot of neurologists have no experience with autonomic disorders and go to one may not do you any good. Uh, gastroenterologists, they may be very much in tune with certain aspects, but not the rest. So each one of us is so subspecialized, unfortunately, these days that um, it's not that they want to ignore the other aspect, it's just they are not comfortable in dealing with the other aspect. So, um, obviously for me it's easy. I have a bunch of great colleagues and now, you know, as we said, we learn on, on the skin of our patient and, you know, on our own mistakes what this is and the complexity of it. Um, I think at the end of the day, probably you're better off to start with a very good solid internist that's willing to work with you and tell you when you say, okay, today the problem number one is the GI and tomorrow maybe the EDS, who uh, is going to be his collaborator? So uh, I think this is a cry for stop confusing us. <laughs> and I th <laughs> So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think if you will go for, uh, for this scientific meeting and you will hear... Um, the science and the research going on from all of this. As I said, you know, this research group that we are, everybody of us has a, 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 an interest in some area that he will explore it further or she will explore, explore it further than the others. And then, you know, we will be emphasizing this po point by a bias. And I will say that probably everybody of us is biased for what his research is going on. I think the idea of multidisciplinary clinics are the best for this. And we realized this point, you know, about five years ago, and we have a GI specialist with us, an immunologist with us, a neurologist, I'm a cardiologist, and we have a general pediatrician with us. So it's a five physicians with multiple subspecialty, and then we see the patient between the group either in the, in the same clinic, usually we tend to see the patient in the same clinic between cardiologist and 
neurologist, but you know, we can refer for our you know, gastroenterologist and other people. So I think that's, that's the key for this. Centers who will claim that we are a dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction centers, probably they need to work on getting multidisciplinary group our physicians to, uh, because those patients, we know that they have multiple G problems with this. Now, I, I will tell you this, that always think of the basics and start with the basics. So don't jump to, you know, muscles and, you know, the cytokines and then the Ehlers-Danlos and then the, you know, the anti-nuclear antibodies, what to do with those. And, so uh, probably I will start with the things that it will be working for most of the patients that we spoke about and you heard that was, uh, about that. Pushing more salt, m pushing more volume, blood volume um, by increasing fluid, probably using the Florinef, probably using some of the medication to increase the blood pressure, some of the medication to decrease the heart rate. And we'll start with that before we jump into the bigger things that if, if we need to address it. Yes, some of the patients, I will tell you, you know, from our experience, about 70% of the patients, they will just improve by the basic things that we do without any going for fancy medications and, you know, some of the medications that just came from FDA or some of them, they are uh, even not FDA approved yet for that purpose. So seven, more than 70%, they will improve by the basic things. So uh, I think the confusion part also, if you will go for another person, probably your daughter will be diagnosed with something else other than the things that you just mentioned. Yes, maybe she has carry one. Yes, she has ehlers danlos Probably she has POTS also in the tilt table test. She has probably some autoantibodies and probably will go to the gastroenterologist. She has gastroparesis. She has this and she has that. And if each physician you will go to, he will give you a new diagnosis and you will be confused more. Back to the basics. Go with, first of all, the, your primary physician of dysautonomia. And fortunately, you know, again, this is the problem that it can face people who are not living in a city or an area that they have a dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction center. And that's one of the problems that, you know, unfortunately will face. But start with the basics and then tailor things after that. 70% of the time, you will do fine with the basics. So I will, I will advise for that Thank always. You. Um, okay, I have a question. Um, do you is Just a, a quick follow-up. I actually disagree a little bit. So I, I, I agree with the basics part, nice but try, of everything you said, the treatments ultimately are actually not that different. If you have GI problems, by all means, see a GI specialist. If you have headaches that your primary physician can't sort out because they're not a headache specialist and the one or two things they know how to do don't work, see a headache specialist. Most of these therapies are not going to be mutually exclusive. So the one exception may be the one you brought up. So there's certain types of exercise that if your joints keep popping out, that you're not going to be able to do. So you have to modify that. But for everything else, I think, I think the challenge is that with a collection of labels, it can seem more daunting than it is. But if you actually go and look as, as you did during this, you know, during this meeting where you had talks on EDS and looked at the, the constellation and, and the talks on the tryptase deficiency and looked at the broader constellation of, of symptoms, they overlap greatly. And quite frankly, their approaches aren't that different from one to the other. With the exception of EDS, you know, if, you, if your joints pop out, don't do the thing that makes that joint pop out. So you may have to modify the exercise regimen, right? So maybe swimming instead of you know, pushing on a rowing machine if, if your knee keeps popping out. So I, I don't think it's, I mean, it's, it's daunting any way you cut it, but I don't think it's quite as bad as you made it out to seem that you have all these doctors and these disorders telling you entirely different things. Most of these approaches will be compatible, I think. Okay. Um, does... Um Autonomic dysfunction contribute to blood sugar irregularities? Uh, patients with POTS a lot also, they have issues with nutrition. Their really nutrition most of the time is not optimal. So just talking about the basics, uh, the patients with, uh, with, with POTS or dysautonomy, they need really to eat a good breakfast, in my opinion, with complex carbohydrate, you know, not just sugars or something. Of course, unless they are, uh, uh, they need to watch that if, unless you have uh, sensitivity to gluten. What I've noticed, 
I've noticed that patients uh, with POTS are sensitive to, uh, to their hypoglycemia or relative hypoglycemia because what happens when you become hypoglycemic, your sympathetic nervous system or your, basically your adrenal gland tries to uh, produce more uh, uh, adrenaline in order to, to mobilize your glyco, uh, you know, uh, glyca, to, to activate the glycagon so you, you uh, metabolize sugars from, from your liver. Uh, so they don't overall, I think they don't respond well. They, they respond adversely to hypoglycemia. And that's why I recommend that they maintain some good uh, nutrition that releases carbs in more sustained, uh, sustained uh, manner. Uh, I have, in fact, over the years, I've seen patients who, who were documented to have decrease in their, uh, in their glucose uh, to, sub, to similar to hypoglycemic levels. And some of these hypoglycemic levels, they start to give you the cognitive uh, fog. They start to have you this. And optimizing this in patients who have also a brain fog, I noticed that I want to optimize this, this basic thing, to be sure you're not going starving. You are not, like lots of kids, for example, lots of, they don't eat breakfast, and then they, they don't eat something significant until sometimes 1 o'clock or 1 p.m. So this is one thing that I noticed uh, with, the, with the sugar things. Now, again, the other aspect that when you eat a high glucose or high sugar, high pure sugar diet, it's, stim it's very prom it's, it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system very, uh, very promptly. And uh, uh, these patients, that's the patients who could have uh, sort of postprandial uh, symptoms or uh, they don't feel well after uh, they, they eat a, high, a pure sugar. So th that's really the extent of my knowledge of what I've seen in as it relates to sugar and uh, to, to glucose and to the uh, sympathetic uh, interaction. I, I think we want to get through as many questions as you can. Dr. Goldstein, can you limit it to like a minute and then we'll move on to the next question? <laughs> <laughs> don't fast and don't pig out. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, First of all, I want to uh, thank you. Uh, can every, wait, sorry. Can everybody please keep in mind there's a lot of people here who want to ask questions, so keep your questions short and keep your answers short, guys. <laughs> First of all, I just want to thank you. As we see by the esteemed panel that we have up there, it really does take a village, and for us caregivers um, who will turn over um, any rock to help our children, um, I think it takes a village on our end as well. My question actually has to do with the um, future of these children. I have a 15-year-old daughter. Um, she has had POTS, mast cell, and EDS for the past year. Um, she, you know, what, what does her future look like? And I was wondering if there have been any studies um, as far as medications that these kids are on for a, a long period of time or just um, working through these issues. If you could talk a little bit about any kind of future um, for these kids. Thank you. Lauren Stiles just told us in the other <laughs> session that don't tell the patients that he will be grow out of this, right? Well, don't say everyone grows out yeah. of it. I think some I, people I think do, but. there is improvement for a lot of people. Yes. And I always say to the patients, um, you know, in, in, in pediatrics, they will come to me and they will say, uh, there is little bit of improvement, not little bit, sometimes um, substantial by late teens, early 20s. And this has been studied. This has been literature shown that these patients with uh, uh, either POTS or neurocardiogenic syncope, uh, they will improve in their early 20s. Now, the improvement, I will tell them that there, is always, there are always triggers. So viral illnesses, uh, uh, fever, trauma, uh, uh, other stresses, it can flare the autonomic dysfunction in this youngster later on in life. So uh, with the pregnancy, it can get sometimes, you know, worse, sometimes with uh, viral illness or uh, something, uh, emotional stresses, you know, parents divorce, something like that. We have several patients that they will do fine for two, three years, and suddenly they will come to my clinic, oh, she is back, what happened? And you will go back in the history, you will, f you will see a stressor 
uh, you know, brought this uh, up again or flare this up again. So the flares of this autonomic dysfunction, it can happen in life. But usually, there is improvement. And I'm talking about the pediatric patients. Most of them, not most of them, I would say about 70 to 80% of them, they improve by late teens, early 20s. Can I just add something to that? I, you guys know I'm not a doctor, but as a patient, I, I think that if you think about people who have asthma, right, they're probably going to have asthma for a very long time. Some kids grow out of it, but sometimes they don't, and they have it into their adulthood. And they have to learn how to manage it and just still live a good life and not worry that, you know, I'm never going to have a good life because I have asthma. I think it's really it's harder to learn how to manage these illnesses because there isn't a lot of info, there isn't a lot of research, and sometimes there isn't um, a lot of answers. But I think that you can learn, you have to learn to, the focus should be learning to manage it and live with it rather than, you know, can I find a magic pill that's going to cure me? Because it's just not there. So that's just my two cents. Sorry. My question is, is it really so detrimental to take naps for POTS patients? They sure seem like they need it. Gisela had a comment on the last question. Oh, I just was going to say quick answering the previous question. What I tell the parents of my teenagers is, you know, like Lauren says, we know this doesn't go away. We live with it. And we get better, but we're going to have flares. So common sense, healthy sleeping time. Be careful when you go to college. Don't do all-nighters. Don't drink excessively. Don't try to tell them, no, no, don't drink. That doesn't mean they're going to do that. But... <laughs> But common sense, you need to go to bed at 10. You can't stay up because when your sleep gets disturbed, then we really uh, backtrack in all the improvement we, we did. Continue exercise. And if we got you in a good exercise program, when you go to college, be sure that you put exercise as important as your math homework or your paper you need to write. Um, and and keep, keep your life hygiene, if that makes sense. Um, and I know this is hard for our college students, you know, when they really have freedom and they can do what they want, and I'm telling them, sorry, you're going to go to sleep at 10 or 11 because you can't afford going to bed at 3 a.m. because then we shift your sleep cycle, then your migraines relapse, then everything gets a mess. So just talking a little bit um, as our kids go older. And I have to say that they, my patients that have really succeeded are very, very strict in their schedule. They keep the exercise, they keep the sleep, they keep um, the medications, and they are very religious in that. Brief answer. As long as it doesn't disrupt their sleep, their overall sleep cycle, and they're not going to bed really late and not getting adequate nocturnal sleep, then uh, a nap should be okay. That would be my view. And it doesn't substitute for exercise. I'm just wondering, is there ever going to be a time where will be technology advanced that all our patients need to do or our children need to do is just give them a flash drive and say, here is my history, here are my medications, here is my family background, you know, can you, without filling endless amounts of questionnaires about them. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's funny. And I said, I, I said the same time. My question, and I've been very anxious to ask it, but I want to preface it by saying, please don't think that by my asking this, any of us expect you to do a lot more than you're already doing because we appreciate it so much. Having said that, um, my daughter's had POTS for seven years, but only within the last year, year and a half, have we discovered the um, social media um, support groups. And while my daughter is kind of tired of it because she's just generally sick of having POTS, I read them uh, religiously. I get a lot out of them. And poor Dr. Abdullah, when we go to see him once a month or so, I always am armed with uh, a million questions and things, concerns that I've learned from the support group from everyone else. So I'm wondering if any of you are monitoring those or contributing to those, and if so or if not, do you see any value at all in, in doing that? That's a very good question because I think that's, uh, we don't want also uh, that like, you know, the experience of these youngsters, if it is not scientific, is to be um, widely spoken for other people and then it can be a little bit more harmful than helpful. Um, the social media and, you know, getting together is really important. You saw last night, I mean, you know, it was very nice. I mean, you know, everybody was happy dancing and in the floor and these youngsters, you know, they have a blast last night, I felt. 
And uh, I think, you know, doing this at the local or regional area is really important. Um, our social group that, you know, uh, they are in collaborative with us, uh, usually uh, there is a, a nurse, uh, we call her uh, the research nurse, usually she will go for their function and attend these functions. So it's like, you know, um, uh, somebody from our group is keeping an eye on the things that it's not going over the board and or doing something that it can be not scientific or harmful, especially they are in collaboration with our group. Uh, <coughs> having done a lot of the EDS support stuff, um, it, it has its pluses and minuses to be there. And unfortunately, it's mostly minuses. Um, a lot of people, like on Facebook, will put my name in a group. I don't know. Okay, that's one thing. And and they'll yeah. they'll invoke my name, saying a bunch of stuff I've never said and whatever else, to give validity to different things. And it's just one of those things. It can be very harmful. Um, there are times when I'm in a group and I get a notice from the group and somebody has an active discussion, which I like to join, which I think is great. But I would say that's very few compared to the times where I've seen my name used in more harmful situations. I also know when people are there, people have left their group knowing that I would be there. Um, either they're afraid to say something or share their feelings or whatever else. And sometimes they were mad at me and wanted a place to actually go say something. <laughs> so it, it's just, it, it's one of those things. Um, yeah. All those reasons besides the lawyers tell me not to be there right. is, <laughs> is one Good of advice. the things too. <laughs> Um, Dysautonomy International, you know, is involved in um, managing several different Facebook groups, and we actually don't allow, uh, it's, it's meant for patients and caregivers only, we don't allow physicians on our groups because, not because we don't want their advice, but because we want um, the patients to feel like they have a safe place to just talk about if they had a bad doctor experience, or who's good to see for this, and who's, you know, who's really good in this city. If your doctor's on there, you're going to feel really uncomfortable seeing anything remotely negative, or, or you might feel like you have to say super nice things maybe when you don't want to. So we think it's good to keep it separate. Um, and a few times a year, we have invited doctors to do Facebook chats with us, and they've always been willing when we asked, kind of get two or three experts and teach them how to use Facebook, which is always fun. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that there's um, kind of a, you know, a good reason not to have the physicians on there. And they're so busy as it is, they, you know, barely have time to sleep, so they shouldn't get addicted to Facebook. <laughs> right. We, we even, as an organization, we kind of, kind of collate that information and the, the collective patient thought process and do share it with the doctors. And the, the Big Pot survey that was launched today, I don't know if you've all heard Dr. Raj talking about it, we are hoping a lot of the questions in that survey are based on things we hear patients talking about on the groups. So we hope that everybody who's online will take that survey and uh, share their patient experience so that it can t get turned into a research article that can actually be published rather than just us talking to each other as patients. Sorry. And, and I'll just add real quick. Um, I agree with you. There, actually, there's a lot of things I learned from the Facebook and a lot of from my patients where they've shared stuff and sometimes they won't share with me or in front of me. A lot of stuff about intimate relationships and stuff that they don't feel comfortable, but yet, you know, in the forum, they're all sort of talking. So I have learned a lot from Facebook and what people are sharing, but at the same time, I know my presence there. So I kind of it, when I did it, it was much more hidden, and now I don't do it because I, it feels a little dirty that I'm hiding, you know. Yeah, it seems like I'm stalking. But, you know, I've learned some valuable things. I've learned some critical things about how my office works and et cetera, which have been useful, but at the same time, they may be inhibiting, and I don't want that to happen. Yeah. So MTHFR and B12, if somebody has high serum levels of B12, could they still be essentially B12 deficient because of the mutation? This is a very controversial area. Um, first of all, some of the genetic changes in MTHFR are so common they're seen in a third of people. That doesn't mean that they have no biological effect at all. It's just that you've got to be very careful if you have it. It doesn't mean you have some rare mutation. You have what every third person has. 
Um, it may be that those people require more folate and more B12, and it may not. It's, un it's unclear. There are also very rare mutations in that and many other genes that I do see on an occasional basis in these patients, and that treatment does make a huge difference in those. But those are not the common ones, and that requires special testing beyond which you would do from a general MTHFR. So it's, it's a very difficult question. I have a lot of patients that say that they've benefited from B12. Um, I generally use a B vitamin complex called B100 that has B12 as well as many other B vitamins in it. And so I never know what, it, what helps, but a lot of times it does help. So it, it's, it's very complex, it's very controversial, no one understands. I'll just say that some people do seem to benefit from it, others don't. And then there's some rare mutations in these genes that do make a big difference. You can't see the serum levels of B12 are pretty useless. Um, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to look at the methylmalonate and the homocysteine levels because those are showing if it's really working or not. So if the, if the, level, so if the levels of B12 are high before you sort of decide it's, it's junk, I, you can get those other things done. The methylmalonic acid is a relatively easy test to get done. If its levels are high, so B12 is a cofactor, right? It's either working or it's not adequately. And this is an end product of what it does. If it's not clearing it, it's not metabolizing it properly, then you may need supplements or you may need to figure out why you're not, you know, what's happening. If those levels are okay, then your B12, you know, you have enough for that metabolism. The, the, there are some rare diseases that will do that, but you would have to have a diagnosis of one of those diseases. There are both molecular and biochemical tests which are very sophisticated that an expert can use to diagnose that. I've seen those many times before. It's just that it's not general information. Can that happen without the methylmalic acid being elevated? So if you, if you did B12 and MMA levels, MMA levels are normal. Can you get a neuropathy from B12 deficiency? Yeah. It, yes. How? You don't have, because the, the MMA is drawing the blood, and what's happening is in the nervous system, and they don't necessarily get it. Well, there are transporters at various cell levels. There's transporters into the lysosome. There's transporters into the mitochondria. And then there's various B12 cofactors thereafter. So it's, if you do B12, homocysteine, and other things, you will generally find almost everything. But there are still some rare exceptions. But lots of time, midodrin really works well, still works well. However, you have, there are some caveats, as I was saying, there is dif big differences between the bioeffectiveness of different generics of midodrin. I don't know, I will, take it, I will take my luck and say that, but I have no affiliation with any company or anything like this, uh, no conflicts of this. But uh, uh, the available preparations, the best preparation available is the one made by Upshur Smith. And you can see that, for example, if you are in one preparation and you just go to a different preparation, one of the preparations is the global, made by global. I literally, you can take water and see what's the difference. I don't think it's effective. It's just so ineffective and so variable. So you need to be sure that you are taking the right dose of midodrin. Uh, it's dosed also, it should be dosed for patient, what I, I check patient's metabolism, but just history. Like sometimes you say, you give a patient five milligram or 10 milligram, you say, how is it really helping you? Does it help you to get uh, the, do you, do you feel more energetic, more focused, less dizzy, less orthostatic? I think in the interest of the time, for we how should uh, just yeah. answer by saying there's never been a comparison of mitogen and uh, yeah. yeah, but Theoretically, they do the same thing. Yes, there has been no, no but you know, again, See, again, when you see, when you see 100 patients a week, when you see 100 patients a week, uh, you see lots of, uh, you can tell about the differences. So to look at these different uh, gener uh, generics, but we definitely there is difference in the clinic patients uh, complain. And we see that when some patients doing well, they go to a different generic, they are seeing difference. So basically I try to be sure that I'm using the midodrin correct, I'm using, I'm dosing it correct to the patient, to his metabolism as I clinically understand it before I go to Doroxidoba. Doroxidoba, I have now about nine patients and I ha I'm having hell getting the insurance to approve it uh, so far. So okay. just, three, just three points on droxydopa. One, it doesn't work the same as mitodrine. Yeah. The peripheral vascular effect should be similar. It will increase synaptic norepinephrine if, it, if it's doing what they think it's doing. And that's, you know, when we talk about high norepinephrine levels in the blood and hyperadrenergic, in theory, it could make it worse. Two, 
Second leading indication probably in terms of sales. We've heard from, I've heard from Lundbeck. So a lot of people plots are taking it based on no data and it could be make it worse. Three, Julian Stewart who had to leave actually has a grant to look at it in POTS patients, but up to now there is, I believe, a grand total of zero patients that have been studied formally, although POTS patients are clearly getting it off-label. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Last question. Yeah. So uh, you guys as experts, when someone comes in to you as a new POTS patient, what is it that you guys do? What is the basic testing you do to see all the other stuff? So I've only been diagnosed with POTS, and I know I've talked to a couple other people who are just diagnosed with POTS, and you come here and you feel like you're missing something <laughs> when you go to all these different, um, different when you guys are talking. So what is it when someone comes in are the basic tests that you guys do or you look for? Uh, do you look for autoimmunities? Do you do the, what blood workup do you guys do? Because um, I know I was just diagnosed with POTS, and I wasn't looked at, they didn't look at anything else with me. So I feel like sometimes there's stuff missing. You know, it's, it's a very individualized approach, you know, and depends what you have. Uh, so that's my approach. Uh, uh, you know, I, I focus on what you have. I based it on the physical, the history of physical examination and what you need. Uh, sometimes, you know, patients come and they clearly they have some autoimmune aspect. And then you focus in, in the autoimmune and covering uh, that aspect. So the things we do, basically what I do is mainly I do the orthostatics, uh, but I do good orthostatics. What I mean, the patient really has to be in a quiet room about 10 to 15 minutes laying down. Then you stand up one minute for uh, three minutes, then five minutes, then we take them. The other test we do is the Valsalva beat to beat, you know, and that's a very useful test because it could show us uh, if there is, uh, you know, if it's sometimes it indicates this could be a hyperadrenergic parts depending on the button. Sometimes it shows you if you look at phase two and it's down sloping going down, it may indicate more of an autonomic failure. So it, it's helpful in different things. And the lab tests, usually the lab tests I do are, I do see a blood test to check the hemoglobin, to check the iron, um, uh, to check just uh, sodium, potassium, uh, aldosterone, to check if the adrenals, basically, adrenal uh, function. And I start with the simple thing, then I advance depending on that. I don't know. So. Quick comment. I just want to make a quick comment. Y you don't necessarily need any testing. It, it's, yeah, really yeah. A, it's, it, you know, it's really a relationship with your physician where you feel the physician is paying attention to you. And they suggest trying a few things. If after a month or two you're better, mm -hmm. then why do all this testing? Yeah. If after a month yeah. or two you're worse, that's when maybe you want to think about more testing as a physician. So yeah. there's, there's no formula, yeah. and you should feel that your physician is listening to you and you should feel confident that you have a plan. You will have 20 answers for your, page, you know, for your question because you know, everybody 25. has... 25. Uh, 25. Yes. 25 answers. Yes. You I, know, I, but you know, I think the basic, everybody I think will agree with that is a good history and physical examination is the key for this. And a good history is a history that it takes probably 20 to 30 minutes to go over that because, you know, uh, other than the questionnaire somebody was uh, complaining about, you know, the, you know, that we have go to, uh, over the questionnaire and everything. So uh, everybody agrees that this is the start, good history, physical exam. Then after that, it will be individualized and probably your response will be uh, for uh, the basic treatment. Uh, it will dictate what's the next step to, do, to be done. Uh, so I think that wraps it up. Um, thank you so much to all of our experts. Give them a round of